HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Brooklyn Botanic Garden, a stunning 52-acre garden in the heart of Brooklyn, open year-round. Learn more at bbg.org. This week, Meat and Three is taking you to market and all over the world, from Newfoundland to Tunisia. Well, a lot of us think of, you know, the British Empire trading things like spices and sugar and silk, but you write that it actually began with salt cod from Newfoundland. <laughs> there was a port closure in Tunisia, which was horrible. I mean, it was months, boats just setting on the water waiting to go and they couldn't go anywhere. And we'll learn about how markets have changed, whether because of their customers or the climate. A few years ago, something around the 10 years, it was uh, totally different. It almost manifests itself to almost smelling like an old fire pit. When you, mm-hmm. when you put it out, it has that sort of charcoal smell to it. It's not good for wine. Join us this week on Meat and 3 for our global market tour. And don't forget to subscribe to Meat and 3 wherever you listen to podcasts. <laughs> Welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey guys, I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here at Beer Sessions Radio. We're in studio. It's in July 2019, and we're recording a special episode that you'll be air- airing in August of 2019. And uh, there's a little backstory on this. As many of you know, I, I love German beer, and uh, more and more I love seeing traditional styles that are being made with, with craft and care. And uh, I feel like the, the number of brewers around the world are really doing the, the right thing. Um, through our friends at Shelton Brothers, we have met a, an exciting uh, brewer who has a science background from Berlin, and she's going to introduce herself, and that's what our show is going to be about today. Hello, I'm Ulrike. I'm owner and uh, brewer and um, everything from Schnee Eule Brewery uh, in Berlin. And this, by the way, the first, uh, the only one real Berliner Weiss brewery in the world. No, and that's amazing, and we're going to talk so much about that, sour beers and, and beer traditions and everything, and our good buddy from Shelton Brothers. Hey, it's just Joel here. I'm not as special as Ulrike, but uh, I look good on the radio. Well, we, we got a nice show. We might have Pete Langle from KCBC joining us as well. Um, Joel, a little backstory. How did you, Shelton Brothers again, around the world, always finding these specialty Craft brewers, how did you find Schnee Ull? Well, Jimmy, we, Schnee Ull. Schnee Ull. Snow Owl is the image. It's the weirdest. Uh, we should say something about that word because Americans have trouble because there's three E's in a row, which is not unusual in Germany, but uh, in America we don't do that, right? Schnee Ull. It means snow owl. Schnee is snow and Ull is owl. And they just put it together and there you have Schnee Ull. Um, I was introduced to the beer by... Is that a CBD product? <laughs> <laughs> it could be in the future. That gives yeah. her an idea. Schnee Ull. Um, my brother Dan invested in this. Uh, he's, he's a co co sponsor of a festival called Mash in Barcelona, where we're pretty active. We import a lot of beers from Barcelona. So a couple of our partners there, Edge and Garage or Garage, as they say, they're British guys. They asked us to co sponsor it last year, so we we did that. Mash Fest in Barcelona in October 2018 was our first. Uh, version of it that we were involved in. While I was there, of course, when you go to Europe to a festival, you're going to run to people from around the world. 
asking you to try stuff because people come to us a lot. You know, are you interested in this? You want to do this? Because we're always interested in everything. And this guy, uh, Stefan oh, I Kruger. Forgot, Kruger, I forgot. I keep forgetting these crazy names. Uh, Stefan Kruger, who uh, is from Berlin and friends with Uli, uh, brought us some bottles of Schneeuerle. So in the middle of this crazy fest in Barcelona, we were trying to f focus on these, trying these very low alcohol Berliner vices. So we couldn't get too much information from that, but we were, of course, right away interested. And the more we read about it, the more interested we were because it's a real Berliner Weiss brewery. And of course, those kind of things interest us greatly. So let's go back. So uh, Ulrika, um, tell us how you got started. I know you had, you went, you had a microbiology background, science background. Why did you start making beer? Um, I studied beer, uh, brewing technology in, in Berlin. Um, and in the industrial style, first first um, five years, and uh, it was a bit boring. So and uh, but uh, then I saw uh, the craft then developed the craft beer scene in Germany, and uh, one time uh, I had the real Berliner Weisse in a party, and drank this night a lot of it, and I thought a hey, the perfect beer so i just fall in love with this beer it have low alcohol is uh, delicious and next day is no hangover and it's tradition traditional in berlin so i couldn't understand why it's not uh, of course you a brewer in berlin you have to do berliner weiser yeah, i've had some no really brainer. good berliner weisers i think the, earlier joel and i were talking I mean, the, the modern version of Berliner Weiss was kind of distorted. So back in the time of Napoleon, 1807, in Germany, this was the style of beer, wasn't it? Maybe there were 200 breweries making Berliner Weiss. It was called the champ a champagne of the north. That's, that's, is, that's it. Is this, in uh, English writing. It's a, it's a bottle fermentation, usually, also in this time. And so it can develop the, the nice... Uh, mousse, yeah, it's not just a foam, it's a mousse. So high carbonation and uh, little bubbles. Uh, they um, make the mousse on the tongue. That's uh, special. So it just, just works in, 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 a, in a bottle. Um, but also have a, have a nice taste. It's not that strong. Yeah, a um, uh, little bit sour. So some uh, vices. Here, so just kettle sours are too sour, and also, okay, the the big um, um, now Kindelweisse from Berlin is also too sour. My, I think. That's a Berliner Kindel being the brand that people know about from the '90s. Yeah, I think it's sort of it's disappeared now. No, no. Oh, it's still there. Well, but we don't know. It, it was the one that survived. And <laughs> this we is the one where that. you have the, the images in like Michael Jackson's books of like a, a goblet of this Berliner Weiss with different colored syrups that yeah. might be used to sweeten it. Because it was just crappy, sour It is, beer. And, and boring. And you put sweet syrups in. And, and boring, yeah. And it's, <laughs> it, it comes from, from the 70s, so the, the, the children of the 70s have it uh, in their head. Hey, yeah, Berliner Weisse for us, for the children. Low alcohol, green and red. And that's a tradition. So, but it's not true. But Berliner Weiss is much older, and uh, 100, 150 years ago, it was wasn't uh, sweetened. So, just the uh, adults um, put in the evening maybe a booze inside, so liquor or uh, a kümmel schnaps to to have, yeah, to to have the uh, drunk at least. Uh, to be drunk at least, oh, so because they, they, they drank it the whole day, and when you drink it the whole day, then yeah, first it's it's not that sour. Yes, you can't drink two of them in in a day, and also you don't get drunk in the evening when you drink the whole day. I mean, it's, it's definitely beer. refreshing. And Pete Pete Langle from KCBC just joined us. Pete, thanks hey. for coming over, man. Thanks for we having love me. Love that, that nice KCBC is so close to Roberta's Pizza. Over here, it's hot out. I'll tell you that much. But <laughs> I, I would jump you up to speed. But I, I think that you probably have a lot to say about about sourness and dryness in beer, uh, along the lines of what Ulrich is saying. Just how refreshing it is, but maybe some of the science behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we we're doing kind of a a cheap American take on the Berliner Weiss, mostly with with our kettle sours, which I know is a like a four letter word for a traditional 
Berliner Weiss Brewery. It is today, Pete. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we're, we're just souring with lactic culture, two different strains. We take it down to about 3.2 pH, and I'm looking at TA these days. And then we kind of balance that out with fruit. So we, we get an additional souring from the acidity of the fruit and sometimes a malolactic fermentation on that. But the, the perceived sweetness of the fruit tends to kind of balance the sourness, much like in a regular beer where the hops are balancing the sweetness of the residual dextrins. So we kind of fruit most of ours, and that's kind of maybe why the syrups were happening as well. It, just, it makes it a more approachable beer at, at a very low pH of 3.2. Um, we also do a lot of mixed fermentations in oak, so we're doing more of a natural souring that way, but... The majority of the beers that we've been putting out are kettle sours, and and I'm really interested to try these um, natural. You're, you're souring these off the grain. What? You're getting the acidification from the malt. Yes. Yeah, the traditional yeah. Tech, sour mash. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I never bought lactic oh. acid bacteria. Yeah, and then you're doing a refermentation with with a uh, uh, Britannomyces. Also, okay, you have to have it in, in Berliner Weisse. Yeah. My, my professor, Professor Metner from TU Berlin. Um, uh, uh, like technical the, University. Technical Berlin. University. Um, he, had, uh, he was um, uh, the professor in the, uh, brewing technology. Um, and he had his, made his PhD about Berliner Weisse and he found out um, that you have to have bretonomyces inside, else it's not the same development of the taste n and the characteristic is different. So it's like, I don't know... Uh, uh, Just not authentic. No, <laughs> yeah. definitely not. So it's, it, yeah, mm, if you know um, champagne, then you know it's a natural sparkling. Yeah. Then you have... Uh, wine-like aroma and you can get it w just with kettle sours. That's not possible. You yeah. have to have a wild uh, yeast. And inside. bottle conditioning. So we, we little know a little about this. Yeah. You can read uh, Justin Kennedy, our producer, wrote an article earlier this year in Punch Drink uh, about your beers, Schneeule. Mm -hmm. And um, also, if you can translate the German, Hopfenhelden, on, in Germany wrote, wrote about you as well. So there's a lot of information out there. We want, to, want you to talk more about this traditional method. So you're saying you're sour, souring the grain, the mash, and, and you're working with bread. In the whole room, let's talk about why that's important. Because I think, I think Pete was on to something. I think that there's a lot of sours out there. I think a lot of people get confused about what sours are, and I think a lot of people like to drink sours. But I think that they also want to know, like, what's a, what are the traditional sour beers like this Berliner Weiss that we should be drinking? So who wants to start with, what, what is this well, method? I'm not going to talk about the method like these two are, because I'm not a brewer whatsoever. And, in fact, one of Uli's emails to a, a brewer that she collabed with in the U.S. was so confusing to me that I was tempted to write back and say, are you guys messing with me? Because I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Why don't you just make a lager? So I won't get into that. I'll just get into the whole thing. Why I love German beer so much is that they have their old techniques that existed for whatever reasons hundreds of years ago. The, the, the goal being always balance and good flavor, whatever the style was, whether it was lager, which was maybe on the sweeter side, or Berliner Weiss, which obviously wasn't just on the sweeter side. Um, so the techniques that worked in the old days, for me, are always more tasty. They were painstaking, as Uli will mention later. They took time to do it and took... Uh, you know, the Brett and all these things, and it took more time. And inevitably, you'll end up having versions where you do it quicker, and that's what happens with every style, and it's happened here in America. And I think people now are getting more interested in, oh, really going back and seeing what it is rather than just sort of getting the fringes of the flavor of it. I think Pete would agree with that. Not everyone's capable of doing it with the technology. That's what's the problem, I think, in some ways. It's sort of the same thing that happened with cast, cast condition and maybe later... Uh, real lagering and that kind of thing, and now Berliner Weiss and Goza and that kind of thing. So I, I, that's as technical as I will get. Absolutely. Like, there is, as small businesses and craft, there's a financial pressure to put beer out as, you know, turn the tanks as fast as you can. But there's a, there's a, a shortcoming in the beer. It's, there's a difference when you make it the old way. You take your time. Like a Lambic beer is a three-year beer. We're doing those as well, and most craft breweries these days have barrel programs, and we're doing all these alongside our regular production but 
there is a difference, and I really appreciate what, what you're doing here. And it's you can taste the difference in the glass right now. It's delicious. Cheers. Prost. Thank you. So, Ulrika, t- tell us about the first beer. So, we're going to taste through all your beers, and that's another reason why Pete's here. You guys can talk about taste and flavor profiles. We, we, we uh, tried the Malena. That's an uh, original Berliner Weisse. So, without shishi, no aromas. <laughs> just Berliner Weisse. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the beer. So... It's the uh, standard. It's the standard Berliner Weiss without without it's frills. It's the standard. Yeah. yeah, that's it. You you taste it's not that sour. You can drink it. It's easy easy drinkable. So um, okay, now it's it's a bit cloudy because I shaked it <laughs> the whole time in my my time here in in US. Usually it's uh, it's now a half a year old, so it's almost clear. So and then. Yeah, you can see how it how it is without the yeast, and with the yeast. And that's so it. tell me about your brewery. So uh, it's, it's, it's the brewery. describe it to me. It's in a busy place. <laughs> My brewery is really small. I'm the only pe- person work there. Sometimes I have ha- I have helpers, um, and my husband did all the um, paperwork and uh, marketing. Um, guerrilla uh, internet marketing stuff and uh, he is a big organizer of the of the uh, uh, travel <laughs> and um, I just do the art of brewing more or less um, and yeah so it's, mm, it's very small you're in we a have factory a, we have a small uh, room in Borsigwerke this is in uh, Berlin Tegel in the north it, it's a huge industrial um, um, uh, area. Uh, they produce their yeah, huge uh, pressure tanks for met- uh, petrochemistry. Um, and then I brew and I have 100 square meters in this area. And it's yeah, more or less the, the, the toilet there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, looked, I looked for a, a, a room not that big, maybe with drain on the on the floor, with uh, water, and um, uh, a toilet without toilets. By the way, <laughs> is uh, it's the best uh, place for that. Yeah. And so, do, do you brew your your base beer, or do you do you buy the the base beer from somewhere I buy, else? I buy the wort. Uh, someone produced my wort, uh, so how I want it. And then I do uh, I transport it to this hundred square meter area, and then I, uh, the magic going on, you know, with the lactobacteria, with Saccharomyces, Brettanomyces, and of course a lot of physical work, because I have no machines, so everything is craft work, so handwerk. So everything I have to do by myself. So filling filling line is not. So choo 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 choo. It needs time. I have to, to um, I touch the the bottle minimum ten times, in the in the process. So, um, so you, you hand bottle. I hand bottle. I close it by hand. I, I flush it of course before with water, and then it stays. The the full bottle stays then in uh, in pellets also. Uh, in the lager and for for um, uh, ri- ri- ripening, ripening, conditioning. ripening for conditioning. conditioning. Yeah, thank you. I like ripening. This <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> is good. So right, and then Pete, and, Pete and, what's your take on that, Pete? So uh, I like would you imagine that having your getting your mash and the, the stuff she's doing. Very very labor intensive, but it's it's for the love of the product, and uh, I'm, what is your batch size like? My batch size in the moment is 20 hectoliters. 20 hectoliters? Oh, it's, it's pretty big, actually. Uh, yeah, the batch is pretty big. Yeah. But at least uh, I have to, to work with it. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. Hmm. And it's, it, it's not that much, that often that I, I order uh, 20 hex. Yeah. <laughs> so twice, twice a month. Our brew house is 18 hectoliter, which we turn two to three times to fill the tanks. But... You're not you're not much smaller than us. Um, uh, yeah, Naya, it's smaller. Of course, it's smaller. Not much, though. 
it's pretty, it's pretty good size. Um, but you brew brew maybe each day. Yeah. 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 We're constantly. So and not not twice a month. No. <laughs> so that's a yeah. different. Your annual so, production is yeah. much smaller. In the moment, I, I look for a bigger space because these two times brewing in a month, then the lager is full. Um, and so I need more more space to to uh, for storing and also for uh, a labeling machine and maybe a filler, a better one, mechanical. You don't want me to do your labels by hand anymore? Yes, that's yeah. it. Oh, I, I brought yeah. some, by the way. You brought yeah. some labels? Some labels, yeah, here. Putting we have to, to do some labeling? Yeah, yeah we're going to do labeling, right? You can, you can label it, yeah. Anybody then got a bottle? <laughs> this is called Uruka's Craft Kitchen. Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when, I, when I have guests, yeah. For example, uh, uh, um, the, the, the brewer of, of August Schell. So I, I, know, I know him from the VLB. He studied there, brewing technology. Uh, he visited my, my little space. And in this time, it was labeling on the date. So on the... <laughs> and um, yeah, we sit there and talked and labeled bottles. That's fun. That's like craft <laughs> kitchen. <Chase. laughs> Joel, well, how's the reception? Tell us about the, the, the rollout. You're here in New, in New York. You've been in the States. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting because the beer's only been in the U.S. for uh, two weeks or so. Um, the, the shipment came over in June at some point. It's July now. Um, it, it came over just because these guys were coming to visit for three weeks, and they're just finishing their tour today of three weeks. They've collabed in different places and um, put on a few tap events. And as uh, far as I can tell, everybody loves it, which is appropriate. I think everyone, Americans may not be sort of making the exact same thing that they're making there, but I think Americans have good palates. They recognize a real, really good beer when they, when they try it. And uh, I think it's going to do well. I mean, it's hard. You know, importing is harder now with so many good brewers like Pete, you know, messing with us, messing with our business. But, um, you know, of course, we support the local thing. I'm just making a joke. But it, it gets harder let's, and harder with the import. Pop, but but this, is, this is going to do beer. well because it's unique. Yeah, yeah, and that's the point. Let's yeah. pop the next beer, Joel. And then, um, you don't want me so to talk anymore? I'm going to ask her now. <laughs> so the tell us some of the American brewers that you've met, collaborated with. Yeah, I met a, a lot of really nice, friendly, uh, and uh, passion fr uh, brewers. Um, here in uh, New York, we did collaboration with a little brewery uh, called Strong Rope. Strong Rope, yes. And I think uh, Fifth Hammer is a little bit more uh, uh, famous. So Strong Rope, we, my, my husband met in, in Bergen, in Ölfest in Bergen. It's a special, special uh, beer fest in Norway. And uh, yeah, we um, made the... Um, IPA with strong rope. So because I have to learn it, how to do it right. Because uh, the Germans make in the moment these uh, old, uh, old uh, uh, style IPA. So too sweet, not enough uh, hops. hops. Uh, yeah, and that's a little bit a problem. So I want to do it right when I make a uh, uh, blend with uh, this style and sour. Do an IPA sour blend. Yeah. Wow. Pete, do you know uh, anything you want to say? Uh, You're yeah. just happy to be here. And <laughs> I'm actually going to Berlin in a couple of weeks and doing a couple collabs, and both of them want to make hazy IPA. Of course. Uh, <laughs> and I was hoping we could make a lager or, or a Berliner Weisse or something, but... <laughs> it's definitely a thing. What, a lager there. Berliner Weisse? No, a lager or a Berliner Weisse. Ah, or. Because it's bottom fermented. But you see, you, you're, <laughs> makes you're, no sense. your focus has been Berliner Weisse. Yeah, and tell wild, us, wild, breaded, sour stuff. Tell us some of the traditions that are important to you. Is it important to give extra time to this? The, the things that you really care about that make your, your Berliner Weisse so unique and authentic. Uh, I wanted uh, to do mm, like 100, 150 years, 150 years ago or 200 years ago. Okay, it's not that possible because we have, of course, different uh, equipment, yeah, much more uh, efficient equipment in the moment. And uh, But um, the Berliner Weisse brewers just brewed uh, young beer 
and then they sold it to the so-called beer verleger. And today, uh, the beer verleger uh, work wo was was bottling and uh, selling to the bars and stuff like that. And uh, this all this work made uh, the breweries today. And uh, but but uh, the original Berliner Weisse was relatively young when the um, the drinkers can drink it. So and they saw how it develops with the time. So you can go. You can. It was possible to go in a in a bar to order a Berliner Weisse, and then you get a young Weisse. Or you want a, a stronger one, then you order a Märzenweisse. Or you want a, a Weisse from Brett. Don't meet bread on the like today. It was a bread of a shelf. So it's a wooden wooden shelf. And uh, you can order, you could order it, um, I don't know, till, till seven years old Berliner Weisse. So it, from time to time, from um, it is uh, a development like like in wine. So you don't drink a really young wine. Okay, it's possible. Yeah, um, we call it Sauza in uh, in Germany. So you uh, get fast drunk, or so it's a refreshing also more than than old wine. And it's like, like with Berliner Weisse, so the young Weisse is refreshing, have sweetness from the uh, young beer, from the wort, still, and then it gets uh, more and more drier uh, till half a year. Then it's the, the Brettanomyces flavor comes out a little bit, so, and uh, in, after a year, um, it's... Yeah, like in wine, it gets more sweet again. So I, I, I would say it's glucose. Um, and then, yeah, it develops like, like wine too. So I have highs and downs <laughs> in the taste. I'm going to let you talk a lot. <laughs> right. But um, what do you guys think that the market is for sour beers? I mean, people want to buy sours. But th to me, the flavor profiles are all over the place. Sours are definitely uh, a big seller for us. Uh, and our barrel aged sours even more so. It might be may, possibly more of a niche market, but we move them quite fast. And I think the fruited kettle sours are actually very approachable for all kinds of drinkers. Um, and I'd say second to IPA, they're one of our biggest sellers for sure. The fruit, the fruit edition makes them more accessible, I assume, right? Because we yeah. were talking before about how a, a basic sour beer might not be that interesting for people, but when they add the fruit, then especially in the U.S., it makes it more approachable for people that don't even like beer, for example. Yeah, and the color, too, is kind the of color, yeah. draws you in. But, yeah, they're more maybe drinkable for uh, someone that's not so into beer or comes from the wine background or something, or like maybe like a cider drinker that's into funky bass ciders and whatnot. They kind of cross boundaries, and... Uh, the alcohol tends to be on the ones that we do much lower as well. So, so you, you can't... Lower with, with the fruit? Our, when we add the fruit, we're doing a puree. <coughs> so there's a, we're adding some water and ah, we're adding okay. fruit at the same time. So the re-fermentation of the fruit is about net zero as far as alcohol because we're also diluting the beer. Okay, because usually uh, the, the fruit also would ferment it. Yeah, we're fermenting so... the fruit. And which fruits do you use? We're using guava, strawberry, uh, lime, all kinds of fruits. Berry, stone fruit, and um, lots of berries. Okay. So for me, it's brewing um, uh, a process of uh, saving um, edible stuff, or better, you use no edible stuff. So all these products are relatively cheap today, but uh, usually you can also eat it. Um, our, our fruit is <coughs> very good quality fruit. It's yeah, just I, I said it so. Um, in further time, uh, it was like, uh, so the fruits, the stuff you need for, um, for the people, for eating, you don't brew with. Mm -hmm. So that's 
So it's like the, use, uh, the ugly use, fruit, the, the fruit ugly that you fruit, would throw away. Fruit you can't eat Bruised like that. Fruit. So yeah. and uh, I think that makes more sense. And also, uh, I think the uh, beer is also an art of fermentation. So and uh, wine is also an art of fermentation. When you use fruits, then it's a kind of wine. And then it needs bit like wine fermentation art also with the fruits and when I do a fruit beer it needs time so one year minimum so when we fruit our barrel aged beers yeah they're on the fruit whole fruit skin we're doing two different kinds of beers here yeah and we quick, do the quick same beer brand. and yeah you know it's funny the other day I was at uh, Grow NYC which is green markets is, is trying to get more fruit growers to pair with uh, brewers and uh, Jesse from Interboro was there, um, Jason from Strong Rope, but also Anthony Accardi from Transmitter. And, he, and he, he was talking along your lines, Ulrike. He said, I'd like to start using fruit, but I don't have the space because I need the time. And he's, he's an old-style brewer. He wants to, to, to incorporate that fruit and take time with it. I'm not, I'm, I don't quite understand why that's the case. Uh, Pete, do you want to tell me a little more about the science? It depends on what your end goal is for the beer, what you're trying to create here. And fruits are being used in many different ways. A lot of people are heavily fruiting IPAs right now. We've done some <laughs> fruited IPAs. And this is because it's fun and they taste great and we don't really, we're not so, we don't, we're not uh, offended by a tradition or something. We're experimenting and having fun with it and the end product is delicious. Um, so... Uh, if you're if you're doing a traditional fruiting, yeah, you, you, depending on the fruit, you're probably going to go whole fruit, and it'll be the skin will actually break down if you put a sour cherry into a, a barrel and let it sit for a year. It's going to actually digest the cherry, and it'll break it down into a sludge on the bottom. Sometimes you're going to want to macerate the fruit, and you're going to cut it up so you get more contact with the surface so area. Something like a good Cantillon, like a, a creek or something. Creek yeah, Lambic absolutely. Would be that. Yeah. Yeah, and Ulrich, I, I like this. Every time he's mentioned fruit, you've been laughing. <laughs> so I want to know, because like, even a few years ago, it, the, you know, Sierra Nevada had an IPA with a, a tropical fruit, or Ballast Point for a long time had a very popular g g grapefruit IPA. Do you think that's crazy? I'm, I'm interested in your... Because you're laughing. It must, yeah, it must I, sound I, crazy I because, to you. Because, um, I used to think I, it was I, crazy, I, too. I drank my, my first IPA, I think, 13 years ago. So then you you can laugh now. <laughs> so uh. <laughs> we know it much more longer. And for me, what's totally interesting because oh wow, what a fruity taste! What is not fruit? It's uh, hops. Oh, interesting. This is the taste of hops. So and it's a real beer. So it could also also um, yeah do a brute like a German Reinheitsgebot. So it's just hops, water, uh, grains, and yeast. So, and now it's the uh, other way around. So they water the nice beer aroma with fruits, uh, with eatable fruits, by the way. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds for, like... For, when, for, when me, <laughs> it's, for me, it's, it's, it's not that... Uh, it's not uh, out of brewing anymore. It just make fast money. Yeah, uh, it sounds like definitely not for the money. Yeah, let's change that. Uh, but <laughs> one thing I will say, it's it does sound like that you are embracing traditions that that you're used to. And it sounds like when Pete goes to Germany, he also wants to learn those traditions. But at the same time, probably so many of the brewers in Europe now want to make the IPAs and things that move. I'm gonna ch let's just change the subject for a minute. Um, Joel, um, we are here in New York City. You guys have been all over the place. Uh, through some of the festivals, I know that Garrett Oliver, Elurka met Garrett Oliver. Um, you guys have been at Strong Rope. Tell us a little more about this this U.S. trip because she she's very unique. I mean, we don't get too many uh, traditional Berliner Weiss brewers coming to New York who are really trained in German brewing. We never get any. Um, well, the the idea I think. Well, I mean, America has a huge influence on German so-called craft beer. You know, people call craft beer is usually IPA there. But I think it, it's interesting. This whole discussion is interesting because you have two different sides sort of clashing a little bit, which and uh, different values in some ways. 
And it's, it's so funny to see the German and the American versions. Uh, I, I guess it's funny to me because I'm just sitting here watching the two sides. But everything's valid, obviously. And we like to bring... We're Shelton Brothers has always been interested in this so-called authentic thing, which I, I think Ulrika would stand for that. You know, she would she would be such a thing where she's, she's trying to do what, you know, the right way. I'm putting my hands up uh, as in quotes. Similar to Cantillon, maybe, or something, or maybe uh, Tilo from Ritter Goods, something like this, which we're really interested in. Um, at this point, I guess I always have to stay in the middle of it because we also import stuff that's not along those lines. And, and at this point, we have to do all kinds of things because the market changes. As Pete is saying, he's not doing it. You know, it's not a, like we're doing it to make big bucks. It's just this the reality of what you do in America now. And stuff can be good, made a quick way in all kinds of ways. But also, I think so, the American market is probably interested in some of the authentic products. Yeah, but, but what I was going to say when I hear them talking is there's always two different things. It's like politics where you have people going total Trump and people going completely opposite Trump as we speak, right? Every day it gets more and more. And I think there's always these two sides. It's a simplification, but when Ulrika talks about, oh, this is the way, this is this a German thing also, I think, if, 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 I don't, if you don't mind me saying that, oh, this is how it's done. And I like that about Germany, and I think Pete does too. We I go over there and you say, that. and people will say, this is the correct way. And some people find, you know, a lot of Americans get bugged because Americans always want to do everything new all the time. But I, I appreciate both sides, and, I, and I'm glad to be in part of both worlds. As an importer, you get to do that. And so you have one side, this is the right way, and fruit doesn't, shouldn't be used that way. And, that, that, and that's a very German thing. And the American thing is we can do whatever we want, and they're both valid. And, it's, and I don't think we ever need to get to a point where if this is right or this is wrong or this is good or bad. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in the end, in, in the end of times. But uh, for, for us, it's interesting to bring someone like Ulrika over to meet people like Pete and meet other brewers and meet all these customers and see what happens. Because it's a really different planet, even though it's still, I mean, the world's getting smaller, but still there's differences. And that's what's really interesting to me. This episode is brought to you by Brooklyn Botanic Garden. A stunning 52-acre garden in the heart of Brooklyn featuring spectacular plant displays year-round. Make the most of the last days of summer on Thursday, August 22nd at Brooklyn Botanic Gardens Beer and Bocce Benefit, a -a one-of-a-kind garden party featuring lawn games, live music, and unlimited beer tastings by some of Brooklyn's top beer makers. Proceeds from the Beer and Bocce Benefit provide essential support for the garden's educational and community programs. Learn more about Brooklyn Botanic Garden at bbg.org. We don't have too much time. Let's talk about the, the rest of the beers and let's make sure we taste them all. So what's this, this next beer? This is Irmgard. Irmgard is, is not a real Berliner Weisse. It's a, a Berliner Weisse style because um, it's not a real beer, by the way, because they have no hops inside. That's also the reason it's uh, quite sour. Uh, instead of hops, uh, we have uh, uh, ginger, um, a lot of ginger inside. And uh, yeah, I, can smell I the cooked ginger. it. <laughs> yeah, I cooked it with uh, 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 lemon, orange, and pomegranate peels. So to add a little bit more antioxidative stuff. And um, it's of course have just three percent alcohol, or, or three and a half. It's uh, have living lactobacillus inside and living yeast. So. Um, well, okay. is it true with the nice the Reinhardt's in Germany? If you don't, that's that's not right. Can this, can this, it's, it's not a beer. So it can't be called beer. <laughs> no, that's so not a beer. In your other, your what Berliner Weisser, can it be called beer? Yeah, what is it called? It's just, um. Yeah, Berliner Weiss is a bit special. It's it's sour, so it's also not like Berliner But is, Ber- uh, is Berliner Weiss, can you call that a beer in Germany? Wouldn't do that. <laughs> of course, I pay uh, alcohol tax and beer tax, but uh, I wouldn't call it Berliner Weiss. Uh, no, I wouldn't call it beer. Of course, Berliner Weiss is a beer, but it's a special, traditional... Uh, local specialty what's um, accidentally drinkable I understand and what, and what it tells about the taxes I want to just get a little s- snapshot of Germany as a brewer what, what taxes are you paying 
that we we pay tax for uh, plato means relation to alcohol and hectoliters volume so that's okay. we now let's go to the next beer what's the next one we're going to taste all these beers oh we should we should mention that all the uh all of these beers are named after people, people, the names of people associated with Berlin in some way. Um, Marlena that we had before was um, from Marlena Dietrich, the mm -hmm. famous actress, who was um, kind of a great patriot in the end, helping helping a uh, anti anti Hitler kind of thing. Um, then we had the, the, the Irmgard. You, you mentioned also? Hitler and Trump today, Joel. Oh yeah, two of my favorite people. Please, <laughs> um, no, co it's a coincidence. But we didn't mention Irmgard, and this is the this is a. You have to remember. Irmgard Cohen is a, is a poet uh, yeah. from the time of Hitler, Hitler time, and she uh, um, wrote s stories about uh, love between men and women. So, and um, of course, in Hitler time, it was Entartete Kunst, and they burned their, uh, the, the books. And she um, wants money from the, from the government because she had no income with it. Of course, wasn't. Uh, good and she have to leave Berlin <laughs> and um, yeah so uh, but it's really special so in this time and what is what is this beer? so this What's one this one is this? Kennedy who you can imagine um, ich bin ein Berliner or he didn't say it like that ich bin ein Berliner yeah and, and but, the, uh, the Berliner would say uh, weiße so we you know <laughs> It's a joke for Weiße, Germans. So it's a, a joke for Germans because it sounds like he's saying he's a beer, he's a uh, vice beer. But people <laughs> yeah. don't realize that unless they're in the beer. But what's, what's different about the beers? I love uh, the backstories, but for me, for me, I just noticed the flavors. The Irmgard is much to me more more sour, a little a little uh, it is less sour. drinkable to me than the Kennedy, the one we're having now, the Kennedy, which is my my personal favorite. Uh, I, I like. A little bit less sourness myself. This uh, hopped American style, so cold hopped. That's there you go. I'm an American. Kennedy. Yeah, that's that's the reason it's, it's I call it America uh, uh, Kennedy, because it's an American. So, and uh, I hopped it first with uh, American hops, but it's hard to get uh, fresh American hops in Germany or for me in this small scales because I, I don't need that much. So I don't need. 10 kilograms or tons of hops, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I switched to German hops, and also it's more regionally, and it fits better to, to this German beer style. So it's uh, more uh, European fruits, uh, herbal, uh, grassy. Pine. I just learned something about politics, and I'm going to tell everyone because someone's oh. going to pick up on this. If you're one of the 20 candidates running for Democratic. <laughs> Uh, nomination for president. Look back to Kennedy. <laughs> Obviously, people really liked him. So you, you you don't need to reinvent. You just have somebody on the board. Okay, next one. This flavor is Pete. When you you taste these last two different, uh, the ginger one tastes like ginger. I I know that. But yeah, to you, cool. can you tell that one's hoppier than the other and one's more sour because they're very subtle. Yeah, I can detect the sourness, the difference in sourness. I'm not sure I'm picking up much of the hops, but I think there's a lot going on in the aroma as well so, so it's definitely it, different to to malina it's different for sure yeah and uh, the difference is it's the hops yeah. uh, and this is uh, halotawa blanc and calista ah. so, so halotawa blanc is more modern hops. so uh yeah modern that's true modern german um uh, yeah this halotawa blanc is, is like the name sounds it's like wine yeah, wine like we've used aromas. both of those hops yeah. yeah they're, what, they're what's the hop, Pete? Hallertau Blanc and Calista. Blanc. So that those are those are modern German hops. Yeah, yeah. I think they're maybe from Huel. Do you know where they developed? Um. <laughs> well, it's also funny what what Pete knows about Germany. And just a couple years ago, you were on with some Shelton brothers. You were with Gon Stahler. Yeah. You were with Ethan from Rockaway Brewing. You guys went down there, and I, and I, I kind of know my picture of Germany is through Shelton brothers, <laughs> and uh, Be United. I, I I know Sebastian Zauer. At Freigeist, you know, I know some of the guys in Bamberg, um, but you're you're in Berlin. So how many brewers are there now, and, and what's the potential? Should we go to Berlin for a beer a beer tour? Is there is there cool stuff there in Berlin, or only you? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is some cool stuff in Berlin. You have to find it. 
that's not the the bigger ones, I would say. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe if if you if you like brew brew dog, then I uh, would say it's uh, the biggest in the moment in Berlin. So stone uh, leaf Berlin. Um, but but you will find uh, some nice uh, um, bars with uh, breweries. So for example, Straßenbräu is really nice. They also have a sour beer program. Um, and uh, so they're a, b a bar that also brews beer. Yeah. Wow. So uh, yeah, Vagabund, for example, also made uh, Berliner Weisse. Um, and uh, I, I also like Heiden Peters. So, and um, yeah. There's a bunch of little brew pubs around. They've been there for a while. Yeah. A lot of them been there for a while. Yeah. I think Berlin is is a real good place for bars and drinking in general. It's just yeah. not been considered a beer capital other than Berliner Weisse, which sort of was. Um, was messed with and it didn't really exist so much yeah so pete you said you, you were going to berlin yeah for berlin beer week and tagging along with joel for a, a tour of franconia um and we set up some collabs with uh, some berlin breweries so one's first wyasek i probably murdered that first 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 via check via check yeah via so check, yeah we're making an ipa with them and barrier brewing and then we're doing a, another three-way collaboration with Strassenbräu. Strassenbräu, I said it, yeah. And Strassenbräu. Kraft Zentrum Spandau. Um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, at least it's, it's Berlo. So, Kraft Zentrum Spandau have, uh, is the home of Berlo and uh, First Wirtschaft, by the way. Ah, so yeah, Those. I haven't met any of these guys, so I'm not familiar. <laughs> these were set up through mutual connections. By um, the way, that's that's near my brewery, and uh, they, they brew my my. They world. make your work. Yeah. Oh, right. small world, Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. And, and brewer, brought, brewers... Closer together by the Three Stooges known as the Shelton Brothers. <laughs> Especially me. Since you put that on your website. If you read about the Shelton Brothers, it says, there's a line about the th there's Three Stooges and there's Three Shelton Brothers. But... <laughs> There's only two and a half Shelton brothers. You keep now. me laughing, man. You guys are good. Th this whole the Germany thing is very interesting to me. I, I, you know, look back at the Michael Jackson books, and for me, the first beers I was drinking, were, you know, Aventinus, you know, Weiss and Doppelbox, and um, sh sh you know, to me, I, I get German beers. I, I like different. I like Alt beers. You know, I like Kolsch. Those okay. are beers that I can drink. You like Kolsch? I like Kolsch, yeah. Okay. She hates Kolsch because she's not from uh, Cologne. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I, I That's prefer, how it works. I would prefer uh, Altbier, yeah. So you actually because care. You have different more... styles, regional yeah. styles. Yes. I, so, you know, but not that much. But, but why, yeah, why do you like Altbier more than Kolsch as a style? Uh, taste? Mal is it malt or? Malt, yeah. Yeah. So I would prefer also Lager uh, than Pilsner. Do you guys think that in, we're actually next week? We'll, by the time this airs in August, a little bit over, but we're doing an event with uh, 12 breweries are making beers with local malts in the U.S., but they've been doing it for a while now. And I'm just curious in Germany, do you, do you think you pay more attention to the malt? Could or do you know more? What do you think, uh, Pete? Do you think the Germans are more hyper aware of their malt, have more access to local malt? The brewers or the, the malsters? Brewer, the, the brewers or the malsters, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of those beers are very malt forward. Like many of the lager beers that don't have that much hop contribution. Um, English brewers as well are very into, traditional into malts. Um, Belgian beers, maybe they definitely want a good quality malt and a nice blend, but they're more yeast forward. Americans, we're all into malt as well, but we tend to bury them with hops. Yeah, but I mean, in Germany, are, are there more like small maltsters, any new malt traditions, or are you just buying the, the, the larger malts that are available? Is there? Um, I, I think, I think uh, maybe we have also a m more tradition in bread. So our bread seems better than here. Maybe not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. Um, Maybe more awareness of, of no, yeah, the in grains the, and in the moment. In the moment, a lot grains. of bakeries also close. So mm. and a lot of industrial stuff popping up and blah blah. That's awful, more or less, at least. Uh, but um, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and, and also we we remembering. 
uh, also the old um, varieties of um, grains. So, for example, Kemka is also a new small brewery made sour beer in Germany. Uh, is a lot of a int- uh, little bit interested in, to uh, try something with old uh, 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 barley, for example, and old grains. Joel, I'll knock a candy beer bitter. Oh, it's sprach ein bisschen Deutsch, Erika. Is there noch a candy? Perfect Deutsch. Da? Only a bisschen. Do I have any more candies? Oh. Da ist noch ein, ein Jasmin, würde ich sagen. I, I, I really love seeing the, the world of beer in politics through your eyes, Ulrika. Thank you. <laughs> And I'm, I'm glad you're, you're, you're doing a good job of keeping up with us. I know you speak English, but I also know that uh, we're probably a little slow today. Maybe it's also early. It's only, this is a one o'clock show. The, Joel planned the show like five months ago. That's how He I roll. He kept saying, we're coming in with Ulrika and uh, the Schnee Ulla. Brewery, and I kept writing it down, and they were going to be here for like three weeks. <laughs> Except they could only come today, July 11th They're or busy. Something. They're busy. They're very They're busy. busy. Yeah. So yeah. where else did you take them? You were in, you were in Strong World, but you went to other cities. Oh, I didn't take I didn't them. I get the whole tour. They where, did their own thing. They were where else did they, they go? Did, they're very sufficient, just like the, you know, self-sufficient. The Germans are very good. They come over, and they just get in a car and go nuts. I mean, I've only seen them, like, this is only the third time I've seen her in the three weeks, because they went to, uh, I mean, they were here for a few days. At Schaller, and Ve- Schaller and Weber, they had an event, which is unusual, the first night, I think. And then uh, they brewed with some people. Then they went up to Northampton, Mass., where the Dirty Truth, one of the bars that uh, we're kind of close to in Northampton. Then they had a few days hanging out with Kent Falls, our other friends yeah. in Connecticut. And they It brewed there. Really nice. Yeah. And then they brewed in New Jersey. Uh, no. Uh, no uh, Maryland. Yeah. And, and Bo- no. yeah we visited Baltimore afterwards. Oh, they went to, yeah, and, they went to, I had friends in, in Baltimore. In between, we... we Uh, ah, we visited uh, the referent. Yeah, the referent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and we, we did a, a blend of uh, Woodruff in one of his um, barrels. So we will see how, how it works with the, with the traditional um, traditional um, Woodruff taste in American... Uh, 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 fe- uh, was? Um, fermented beers. So. Woodruff is one of the flavorings, the syrups they used to use for yes. Berliner Weiss. Yeah, maybe yeah. they still do. Um, but yeah, yeah so but, they went to but it wouldn't, else. wouldn't yeah. be green. But what is yeah. the yeah. what is the <laughs> Woodruff right. flavor? What is it made from? That's Woodruff. But it's what is a, Woodruff? It's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a plant. It grows here, by the way. I found it in in Canfords, in the woods. Uh, you can't. You is that uh, legal? Is she she's supposed to be doing that, or <laughs> snooping around our plants here. Uh, <laughs> She's a brewer. She should know where things come from. <laughs> so, it's, so it's a similar, similar, similar nature here around. So you you can yeah. you can. Uh, That's for uh, listeners. Look at what what Woodruff in, in is. The, in the just just end of April, beginning of May, when it starts flowering, and then um, the the Germans made the bowler out of it. So like like a punch. Woodruff, and then uh, you're at Kent Falls. Tell us about that. We know them in Connecticut. So are they actually on a farm? Yeah, so we yeah we uh, prepared a little bit the the lactose from um, from corn from malt. We grow the lactose from 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 malt, and then we brewed the uh, Berliner Weisse. So I think it worked. So I have to. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that the American brewers add that much stuff to their water. So they, they have to, to pre-sour it, so for a sour beer. <laughs> um, I don't, don't, I don't do understand that. that. Pete, do you want to... You, you pre-sour your beer? Yeah, dropping the pH for the health of the lactobacillus, for We, better fermentation. Why, why they are then healthy, more They're, healthy? And we're also trying to prevent contamination, and I think it's also about this off-flavor, um, T, TSP it's called it's supposed to help limit the production of TSP which smells like Cheerios so you imitate the, the pH drop of the yeast Saccharomyces yeah it needs one day for dropping pH with Saccharomyces um, by the way with uh, lactobacillus also so 
Yeah, we do it for lactobacillus. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you learned a lot. So you, you, studied, uh, you studied brewing technology, but also microbiology. Yeah. I know Pete also has a science background. Um, do, do you think that's essential to be a good brewer is to know science? No. 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 Um, I think you, you have to have passion for it. Science and also education could be a little bit a break. So, so uh, uh, stop, stop, not in this. So maybe more in this direction. So, um, okay, when, when you have no idea what you're doing, then start get crazy and maybe you have, you're, you're lucky or not and the beer is good or not. <laughs> um, but like my you first don't, homebrew. You don't, yeah, like that. <laughs> first and last. Uh, <laughs> yes. But, but you, don't, you don't need scientific that much. It helps, of course, to yeah. know what, you st- what you're doing. I, but I, wouldn't, I would have no idea what they're talking about. It makes, makes, makes stop, stop you in, in, in your um, creativity. I'm thinking about Kennedy, so... <laughs> this is great. I'm going to make a toast to you guys. Um, w- this has been a great show. This will be airing in August. We're going to have to wrap it up. Pete, um, it's funny. We started, it's not funny, it's great. We started uh, the show drinking the KCBC Margarita. Uh, Lime Burrita? The pizza, yeah, the Pizza Gate beer here at Roberta's, which is a rice lager. Tell us about that beer. And let's taste one more of your beers. Let's pop a KCBC beer, and we're going to have to close out. So that's, that is a uh, 20% rice. Pilsner, if you will. Um, it's it's just like our strap hanger beer, 20% rice, and the rest is Pilsner malt, fermented at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, cold lager temperature, and lagered for six weeks, hopped with Hallertau, middle through. Um, a simple beer, but kind of a, a riff off of Budweiser, which uses, I'm told, 30% rice as, as an adjunct for them. But we We've been making that for three years now and trying to just show that rice is not a evil, cheap adjunct. It actually costs more than our barley, and it's got a nice flavor. It lightens the color and the body of the beer. And then what's, what's the beer you just brought us now? This is, a, this is an alternate take on that. This is Strap Light. So this is smaller starting gravity, same recipe, but smaller starting gravity. And then it's amylased to where all the sugars are converted into fermentable sugars. Like the Brut IPA tradition, or <laughs> a trend that came and kind of went. Um, so this is fermented bone dry, like a light lager. So it's strap light. That's great, Pete. I'm so glad you're right down the street. You were on uh, Jefferson Street Stop, L Train, KCBC. Great place. Just down the street great from uh, Roberta's Pizza. Big shout out, guys. Thanks, everybody. Pete from KCBC. Joel Shelton from Shelton Brothers. Ulrich out from, say, please say your name Schnee again. I love this. Schnee Euler. Schnee Euler. It's easy. It's All easy, right. Jim. It's easy. And you've got some great imagery. And this show will be up in August. There's some great, the, the snow owl. And um, thank you so much for coming out, guys. Joel, always, you guys have some great beers. And I'm going to keep having you guys on. So thank you again. Ulrich out. This has been great. We could talk for two more hours. And, uh, but again, check out, there's a great Hopfenhelden, it's a German magazine, there's a great uh, p- profile of uh, Schnee on that, and also Punch Drink uh, in uh, New York City, there's an article by Justin Kennedy about them too, so you can read more. And watch me and Pete on Instagram in Franconia. All right. And Pete probably will be Instagramming in Berlin before that, so keep an eye on Pete. Love that. Love the German styles. Thanks Thanks again, our producer, Justin Kennedy. Engineer today was Amanda, and uh, we'll be cleaning this up, posting it in August. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Woo! Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Simplecast is a popular hosting and analytics platform that allows podcasters to easily host and publish to apps like Apple Podcasts. If you have a podcast or are looking to create your very first, check it out. Try it for free and save half off your first three months at simplecast.com slash heritage. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. 
And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.